Good afternoon and welcome to um, our town hall meeting. I'm Nathan Tublitz, I'm a University Senate President and I welcome you all um, for taking the time out of your busy day to come and um, participate in this forum. We have um, people seeing this on video in Portland and in Charleston and this is also being um, sent live across the internet for all those people who desperately want to watch it. Um, the purpose of this town hall meeting, as all of you know, is to discuss and have a conversation about probably the most important proposal that's come to this university in my 25 year history, and that is the new partnership proposal that's been proposed by the administration to change the way the university interacts with the state and the Board of Higher Education. And um, I'm going to take no more time because I want to pass it on to the people who are going to be speaking today. The first person that will be speaking, and let me just tell you who will be on the um, podium today. We have President Richard LaRiviere, who will be speaking first. We were going to have um, Provost Jim Bean speak as well. However, Provost Bean has lost his voice and is not feeling very well and has, um, it's been a group decision to keep him home and keep him healthy. So we wish him the best of luck and a very quick recovery. The third, second person who will be speaking is John Chalmers, who's an associate professor of finance and will be talking uh, about some of the um, issues, the budgetary issues of this proposal from the vantage point of the Senate Budget Committee, which wrote a very thorough report on this issue. And the fourth person is Jeff Condit, an attorney at Miller and Nash in Portland, who's involved in framing and putting together the legislative aspects of this proposal. So without further ado, let me introduce our president, Richard LaRiviere. Well, thank you, Nathan. Uh, and thanks to all of you for coming today. Greetings to our colleagues in Portland and Charleston and to those who are listening online. And Jim Bean did ask uh, to convey his regrets. And, well, he sent a typed message to, to convey his regrets. Uh, none of us have heard him speak for a while. So um, before we do anything else, I want us all to reflect for a moment on this uh, pre precious thing that we call life. On Saturday, there was a horrible automobile accident. This is a tragedy uh, for the entire university and for three families in particular. And I know that you joined Jan and me in keeping those families, those friends, those faculty, those colleagues, peers in our thoughts during this difficult time. We extend our deepest sympathies to everybody who's been touched by this awful event. We wish a speedy recovery to Nick Reese and hope to have him back amongst us on the campus very soon. And I would appreciate it if you'd join me in a moment of silence as we remember his friends, our friends, Colin Lamore and Ellis Heyer. Thank you. Well, we are here to talk about the new partnership. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of this proposal, it's important to remember what this new partnership is about. It's about preserving the fundamental public mission of the University of Oregon. It's about increasing our capacity to contribute to Oregon's knowledge-based economy, and most importantly, it's about enhancing the educational experience and opportunity, access and affordability of our students. Why is this new partnership an imperative? Consider with me some of the facts. 20 years ago, in 1991, the University of Oregon received from the state of Oregon $63 million in state funding in 1991. Today, 
2011, we are projected to receive $58 million. If you take out the federal stimulus money, it will be $52 million. In nominal dollars, we have $11 million less than we did 20 years ago. If you adjust for inflation over those 20 years, we have 43% less to support students' education than we did 20 years ago. What does it mean? It means we remain behind our peers in state funding, support per student. We remain behind our peers in competitive faculty salaries. And it means, most importantly, perhaps, that tuition has gone up 241% since 1991. This isn't sustainable. Oregon has been privatizing its flagship university slowly and steadily without acknowledging it and without even being aware of it by reducing state funding that must be replaced with private revenue sources including tuition. Our future, the state's future, depends on drastic action to curtail, stop, and reverse this pattern of disinvestment and privatization. Our public purpose, the public mission of this university is under siege. What are we going to do about it? How do we address this set of challenges? Should we whine, complain, and beg to be spared harsh the harshest cuts? Don't forget that the state is currently facing a three and a half billion dollar deficit. What should we do about the 25% funding reductions that we've been told to prepare for next year? Should we continue to levy tuition increases on our students at an unsustainable level in order to replace the state's inability to fund their own education opportunities for their own students? I believe these opportunities are fruitless. These alternatives are fruitless. I think it's a waste of time and resources, and more importantly, the wrong course of action. I come to that conclusion because for 30 years, that's what higher education has been doing, pounding the table and saying someone should give us more money. A better alternative, I think the only viable alternative confronting us, is to develop a plan to change our circumstances in a more meaningful manner. A plan that will bring us more stable funding and the opportunity to make progress on long sought after goals like faculty salaries and moderating tuition increases. A plan that makes us less susceptible to the vicissitudes of state funding. A plan that helps drive the state's economy instead of subjecting our students to the fiscal upheavals of the up and down cycles of that economy. In May, we released a paper entitled Preserving Our Public Mission Through a New Partnership with the State. It was the cornerstone of my investiture speech. And just to remind you, we also created a comment blog to provide the campus community the opportunity to provide input. There's a wealth of information on the new partnership website, including the white paper, summaries and handouts, editorials, news stories, and the proposed legislation. We've held numerous meetings on the topic since, both on and off the campus. And today's meeting culminates nearly eight months of dialogue on the topic, including very helpful and fruitful engagement with the Senate. We have welcomed the input on the plan and have modified it to reflect the thoughtful campus input that has occurred. For example, one faculty and student member has been added to the composition of the proposed board, and this is directly as a result of conversations with members of this com campus community. This means that for the first time in the 134 year history of the University of Oregon, students and faculty of this campus could have true shared governance of the university. They will have a voting member on the new local governing board, a true governance role, and direct input on the future direction of the university, including tuition rates. I will very quickly review the details of the proposal. The new partnership has three primary components. Governance reform, number one, creating a new publicly appointed local governing board. 
focused on this university and its fate. Number two, increased accountability through a new governing board and performance goals as established by a state level board. And three, a new funding partnership with the state, creating a public endowment using the existing funding provided by state and matched private donations. Two bills have been introduced in Salem that are the legislative vehicles to accomplish these critical goals. The first is a statutory bill, Senate Bill 559, that creates the new governance structure. The second is Senate Joint Resolution 20 that would refer a constitutional amendment to the ballot for Oregon voters to decide if they want to enable the state to issue debt for the purpose of partially funding university endowments. Senate Bill 559 is 115 pages long, so we didn't bring copies with us today, but both bills are available on the new partnership website. Now I want to address some of the questions that have arisen over the last eight months regarding the proposal. The first question, and the one that's asked most often probably, is what about other universities in Oregon? The statutory bill, Senate Bill 559, is a UO-specific governance proposal, but it doesn't preclude other universities from following a similar path. Portland State has expressed some interest in having their own local governing board, and just last week, a bill was introduced that would create a local governing board of exactly the site, sort that we proposed for the Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls. The Constitutional Amendment, Senate Joint, Senate Joint Resolution 20, is not UO specific and would enable any of the seven public institutions that wanted to adopt a public-private endowment funding model to do so. Another question that we have been asked is how can the state afford to sell bonds? We are asking the legislature not to sell bonds now and probably not, certainly not within the next two years. The only action that we are asking the legislature at this time is to refer the constitutional amendment to the voters. If the ballot measure passes, the state could sell bonds, assuming the private dollars are raised first, which is one of the stipulations. And the amount of bonds and the timing of the bond sales are up to a subsequent legislature to determine in consultation with the state treasurer. There is no immediate fiscal consequence of the passage of Senate Joint Resolution 20. Assuming the measure passes, the bonds won't be sold until the state has greater debt capacity no earlier than 2013 and probably not until 2014. And three, how will you moderate tuition? Under the new funding model, we will not need to create tuition to, to increase tuition to offset lost state funding. That has been the pattern here for at least 25 years. The state portion of our budget will, for the first time ever, be stabilized. And it is my personal dream that one day, when the new funding model is in place, we will create a tuition guarantee program for resident undergraduates so that they can count on the cost of their tuition for the entire time as undergraduates at the University of Oregon. How will elected officials and students have a voice in tuition decisions? Elected officials have a greater campus level oversight and accountability through the appointment of the local governing board than they do now. Students will have a direct vote, our students from this campus will have a direct vote on the new board through their, on, on, the, on the new board through their seat on that board. I can't think of a stronger way to articulate students' voice on tuition. The appointment of the new University of Oregon board is no different than the current state board appointment process. There is no change whatsoever in that pro process. There is still an important role for the state board of higher education to play, but that role is as a coordinating function for the entire state, not a governing function as it relates to the University of Oregon public board. Another question I've been asked is, is there a risk to the endowment funding model? Uh, Professor Chalmers can address that with greater uh, 
expertise, certainly, than I can. But the short answer to is there risk to the endowment funding model, I think, is no. In fact, an endowment funding structure will be more stable compared to a state-dependent funding model than we've ever seen before. Look at the facts that we talked about at the beginning. The value of our state investment has decreased 43% in the last 20 years. It has lost $11 million in real dollars to date compared to our current base state funding. In light of the current deficit our state that our state faces, it's very likely that this number will go down even more and more dramatically. Compare the loss of 43% in counting to the results of our foundation endowment which has averaged a net gain every year for the past 17 years that we've been keeping data on it, of 9.5%. This includes the worst decade in stock market history since the Great Depression. Even if you assume that the new public-private endowment earns zero over the next 20 years, a very unlikely scenario, we would still be ahead of the game compared to the historic trend of our state investment. The risk is minimal to non-existent. Another question I've been asked, do you support the, the Oregon University system proposal and how does it differ from the UO proposal? Yes, we support the OUS proposal and we hope that it passes too. The differences are twofold. The Oregon University system proposal doesn't address the funding issues and therefore does nothing to address access and cost issues. And the OUS proposal differs in that the decisions, in that it defers the decision regarding local governing boards to some unstipulated point in the future. We think both proposals, our proposal and the OUS proposal should pass. In conclusion, let me just say that this is a unique moment in the history of the University of Oregon. We have a window of opportunity in the midst of this crisis to finally address long-standing challenges, to reposition the institution to become stronger than it has ever been. If we are successful, we will be able to plan for our future and create a better educational experience for our students. If we don't take actions, similar to what we've outlined here. History has demonstrated what our fate will be. Our budgets will be cut further, and we will fall even behind, further behind our peers, and more and more and more of the cost of this enterprise will be placed on the shoulders of our students and their families. The time to act is now. I want to thank you all for coming today. I appreciate your attention to these critical issues and look forward to your good questions. And I look forward to hearing what the rest of the panel has to speak. And I want to thank Nathan in particular for arranging for this opportunity for us to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, President LaRiviere. Our next speaker is Professor John Chalmers, who is an associate professor of finance, and he's going to give a faculty perspective on the budgetary aspects of this proposal. And he comes from this uh, vantage point, both as a professor of finance and also as a member of the University Senate Budget Committee, who issued a very thoughtful paper on this subject. So he's going to summarize those issues to you now. Thank you. I, I don't always get applause in class when I show up in the morning, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, to be here and to be part of, of this process and this, this, really this, this attempt to really make a real change at the University of Oregon. I came here in 1996, and I've been a finance professor since then, and, uh, and this is a very exciting time. Like I echo Nathan's comment that this is among the more exciting things that's happened in my tenure here. Um, <clears throat> so in the white paper, we provide an illustration of the benefits of the plan. Um, and that's what it is. It is an illustration, and President LaRiviere mentioned several of the things that are likely to change when we try to implement this in the real world. 
like the bonds aren't going to be sold all at once. Like they're probably not going to be sold for at least a couple of years. But we had to make some assumptions uh, to, to think about and to model what, what the uh, implications of a plan like this are. Um, so basically what we did in, in the white paper and what we've looked at in the Senate Budget Committee uh, is that the state initially provides funding to the university by issuing some bonds. And those bonds are secured by an amount that's equal to the amount that they have supported us in the last year, which is about $63 million. Um, that $63 million, uh, if they were to continue paying that, will completely retire the bonds, assuming an interest rate on the bonds of 7%. So the state's commitment is to repay the bonds, and the state issues those bonds with its authority, and that's that's what the uh, much of the, the the legislative action is required to allow them to do. On the other hand, uh, the University of Oregon commits to raise matching money. So they commit to raise an equal amount of private funding to help set up this endowment. And uh, the private money would come first, uh, the bonding would come second. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great fundraising uh, vehicle. It's a, it's a matching gift kind of a situation. Um, now what happens is then we would invest uh, this $1.6 billion in the illustration that we put together. And we would um, invest that $1.6 billion. Uh, and then we would draw down somewhere between 4 and 5% of that endowment each year. Now the drawdown of the endowment, the 4 to 5%, is a common number in uh, endowment planning. It's something that people believe is a sustainable number. Uh, and it, uh, one of the great things about drawing down on endowment is you can you can uh, dampen the volatility of your of your draws. So you can, uh, in fact, the UO Foundation has a plan that uses the last three years' balances to figure out how much you can pull down. So it it uh, does a remarkably good job of providing some certainty to your budget. Um, so uh, one of the things that we have, and I'll refer to the chart that I have up on the screen. Uh, is first of all, one thing to notice here is the, I believe it's kind of a brownish line, I can't tell from here, uh, but the second line from the bottom. And that line uh, displays what President Riviere mentioned, which was the level of state funding uh, since 1990. It was $63.3 million in 1990 91, and it was about $63 million this last fiscal year, 09 010. So, Literally, we get the same amount of money put in the university's checking account from the state that we got 20 years ago. As you all know, uh, some of you younger students may not know, things used to cost a lot more uh, 20 years ago and, uh, than they do today. So that's what the bottom line shows is, and again, President Riviere referred to this, uh, the spending power of that money has declined dramatically. So we ran a thought experiment, and that thought experiment is depicted by the green line. And what that green line shows is had we put this plan in place, taken the money that would have been put in this endowment, invested it, and earned the returns that the foundation has earned over much of this period. The first few years we can't because the foundation didn't actually have investment performance then. Um, what would our uh, current draws from this uh, endowment model be? And as you can see, they're a lot larger than what we receive from the state. Now, there's no guarantee. Uh, you know, past performance does not guarantee the future. Uh, but, uh, and they say that because it's true, um, but it does look like we have a, uh, a better shot for some substantial increases in the funding rather than almost certain decreases. Um, so from, from my perspective, as well as the Senate Budget Committee's perspective, I think there were several uh, advantages to the plan. I think the first one is, is described here. We have some uh, predictable funding for the university that would come out of this endowment model. Um, and that would provide us with the opportunity to have some control over tuition increases, which right now um, we often don't have a lot of control as I understand it, just because we don't know when the state's gonna cut our budgets. 
um, I think it provides a substantial likelihood of increased funding. And that's what we see here on that green line. It's not a guarantee that we're going to increase our funding, but I think there's um, a relatively low chance that funding would go down relative to what the state's going to give us. And, and, uh, and there's a very good chance that our funding levels would go up. Um, and then finally, and I mentioned this at the beginning, there's some fundraising benefits. Um, matching is uh, you know, providing, doubling the power of the state's money by raising the private money to match it is, uh, is a huge win for the University of Oregon. Um, I guess one of the things that, that people ask, uh, ask all of us who've been working on this is what about, the, what about if the stock market has a hard time? And President LaRiviere uh, referred to this. And Nathan, if you could skip to the next slide. One of the things that we did was we tried to think about, we, we ran some simulations to think about what, um, what are the outcomes that are possible given uh, some assumed returns that the foundation might earn as well as some assumed risk parameters. Um, on the investment corpus. So what, we, um, what, this, what this diagram is meant to show is that between the black line, the green line at the very bottom, that is our um, projected state appropriation. Okay, so we just kept that um, flat. And then here is the, the black line at the bottom represents the 25th percentile in a simulation with assumed returns equal to 9%, which is what the foundation has earned historically, uh, with standard deviations or risk parameters of about 15%. Um, the dotted line at the top represents the 75th percentile. So between the 25th and the 75th percentile, which represents a big chunk of the potential distribution of, of returns, you see we're, we're always above what we're likely to get from the state. So when I say you know, one of the real advantages is it provides for a substantial likelihood that we're going to get more money than we get from the state. This is the type of analysis that, that helps me believe that very strongly. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think this is a, a, a plan that uh, is very exciting, and um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, John. Our next and last speaker before we go to the questions and answers is Jeff Condit, who's an attorney for Miller and Nash, and he's one of the prime um, people who wrote up the legislative concepts that are underlying and underpinning this um, proposal, and I'd like to introduce him now. Thank you, Nathan. Um, it's a pleasure being here. I want to echo uh, comments uh, from my colleagues about what an exciting and interesting project this has been to work on. It's, it's, it's definitely one of the most interesting and probably one of the most important things I've done in my legal career, and I've, I've appreciated the opportunity the foundation gave me to work on this. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in more detail about the specific bills. I do have copies of them here. Uh, this is SB 559, that's the governance bill, as you can see, m very thick, and this two-pager is the Constitutional Amendment, uh, SJR 20. What we tried to do when we were drafting the bill is create the concept of a new kind of educational entity, uh, the public university, and it's a state university, it's a public university, uh, it's a separate uh, uh, independent uh, governing body, uh, that's dedicated to uh, the uh, goals of the higher education and the University of Oregon. And uh, we, um, we, this isn't really blazing new trails. There's a number of different states that have a similar concept, state of Washington, for example, and uh, it is like, a, for example, in this state, a community college district, which is also an independent public body. Um, the, um, the, new uh, entity would be governed by the University of Oregon Board of Directors. This would be, this board is set up very similarly to the State Board of Higher Education. It would have uh, 15 members, uh, seven members would be appointed by the governor. Uh, one member would be a University of Oregon student in good standing. Another member would be a member of the University of Oregon faculty. There'd be one member from the State Board of Higher Education appointed by the State Board. 
uh, and there would be uh, one member of the University of uh, Oregon Foundation Board appointed by the University of Oregon Board and then five at-large members. The president would also serve on the board in an ex-officio non-voting capacity. Uh, the board would have the full governance power over the university. They would essentially uh, perform for the uh, University of Oregon the, the, uh, the um, duties that the Oregon University System Board now uh, performs for all of the universities. And the difference is, is currently the University of Oregon and the other six uh, Oregon universities are essentially divisions of the Oregon uh, University System, which is itself a state agency. So this would be creating the University of Oregon as a separate public body. The, uh, much of the uh, current um, law relating to public universities that is uh, in the Oregon University System statute and the university statutes would continue to apply to the University of Oregon. Uh, m m much of that is carried forward. Uh, w they would, uh, university would be granted some additional independent authority. It would not be a state agency any longer. It would, uh, it would still be a public body subject to what I would refer to as the public governance kinds of, uh, of uh, laws. So it would still be subject to the public meetings law, the records law, the ethics law, um, the, uh, what I would consider the governance laws, and, but it would no longer have to, uh, for example, go through the Department of Administrative Services process if it wanted to buy or sell property. One of the significant uh, portions of the bill is the relationship, the new relationship with the public university, with the Oregon University system. Uh, the Oregon University system right now has both policy and governance authority over the university, as we've discussed. Uh, this would change it to more of a policy board. Uh, it would be the coordinating board for the Oregon University System. It would retain its current authority for degree approval, program approval, uh, ensuring that all the universities work uh, uh, co comprehensively with one another. And our bill would grant it a significant new power, which is the power to adopt and enforce benchmarks uh, that the university would be required to meet. And this, I think, is a significant uh, change. Uh, currently, uh, there really is, uh, there's the, ever, the biennial budget process, but there's no uh, process that requires the state to sit back and say, well, what do we want out of our university system? What, is the, what are the outcomes we desire? And our, the provi this provision in the University of Oregon bill has attempted to try to focus it away from the, you know, the every two years, okay, what are you paying for this or what are you paying for that, onto the, the concept of what is the outcome you want and then how do we get there, how do we require the university to get there. So that's a significant part of the bill. Um, the, there's obviously a huge amount of detail in the transfer over. Um, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, authority uh, from the OUS board to the new University of Oregon board. Uh, we've tried to maintain as much continuity as possible. Uh, there won't, you won't see a lot of change other than instead of driving to Salem for board meetings, uh, you will be able to go to your local board here who will be meeting here. So uh, that is uh, the, uh, basically the uh, governance portion in a nutshell. I'll be happy to answer questions about some of the details uh, later on. The uh, other uh, very significant uh, bill is SJR 20, which is the endowment. Uh, this is required to be a constitutional amendment because in 1859 when the Oregon Constitution was adopted by the voters, uh, the state w had imposed upon it a debt limitation of $50,000. You can't borrow more than $50,000 uh, uh, or it's unconstitutional. Uh, needless to say, there have been a number of amendments uh, that permit the, the state to issue debt. Uh, this, so the, the concept of the state issuing debt is not a new one. There are probably uh, 15 or 16 or 17 separate provisions in the Constitution of which this would uh, be a part of. Uh, that authorize the state to issue debt for various and sundry purposes such as building buildings. And there are a number of buildings on this campus that uh, have been constructed using the state's bonding authority under one of the other provisions of the Constitution. So that part of the concept isn't, uh, isn't new and we're following in the footsteps of those earlier amendments to the Constitution. Uh, the new part of this is, is leveraging the state's bonding authority to create an endowment and then operating uh, the university off the proceeds of that endowment. Uh, as uh, 
uh, has been uh, mentioned by both the President and uh, Professor Chalmers, uh, the uh, state, uh, the uh, constitutional amendment would authorize the state to issue debt up to $1 billion in order to fund this endowment at any of the public universities in Oregon, not just the University of Oregon. Uh, contingent upon the, the, the state's obligation to issue debt, however, is contingent upon the low public university raising uh, matching funds first. So the state's obligation uh, to issue debt does not come into play until the university says, here's our matching $800 million or $1 billion, uh, now you have to issue debt. Um, that's a key part of this proposal, and it's a significant uh, leveraging of a p private fund of the public universities. The, um, uh, as also mentioned, you know, there have been concerns about debt limitation. Uh, many of you may have read the state treasurer's pronouncement that uh, the state is at its debt capacity right now. Uh, the, uh, as President LaRiviere mentioned, uh, the, the uh, likelihood is that uh, the university would not be asking uh, the state to issue bonds for three or four years. Uh, if this is referred to the voters, it will be likely referred to the voters at the November 2012 uh, general election. Uh, then there is a process for the legislature to implement the change, which would happen in the 2013 session. So 2013 would be about the earliest point in time the state would issue debt. And by that time, uh, the state would have hopefully retired some of its existing debt obligations and also uh, the economy would be better. The, the state debt limitation is not a set percentage or figure. It rises and falls depending upon what the projected revenue of the state's going to be and how much of their existing debt is out there. So uh, that uh, portion of it, uh, And we also have built into the constitutional amendment, and this was at the direct request of the state treasurer, a provision in there that allows the state treasurer to uh, issue the bonds in series over time if necessary to manage the state debt limitation. And that also benefits the university because uh, we may or may not be able to raise all of the money for the full endowment at once, and so we can raise a portion of it and have bonds issued and raise another portion of it and have more bonds issued. Um, and so that is the, uh, uh, the constitutional amendment, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And once again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and for giving me the opportunity to work on this exciting project. Thank you. We are now going to move on to the second half of this um, town hall meeting, which is the question and answer period. And we're going to run it in a couple of different ways. Those of you who would like can come up to the center of center aisle and um, ask questions. I would like anybody who comes up to um, just let us know who you are. Um, those of you who wish to ask questions but feel a little uncomfortable doing it verbally, there are a couple of people, um, Dave Hubin and uh, Carla McNelly, who will be walking around and giving out um, three by five cards and pencils so you can write your questions down, give them back to them, and they will bring them back up to me to read anonymously. Um, so that's the way it's going to go. Um, I see that there's a questioner in the back, so let's start with you, please. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, my name is Marcus Widener. I'm a, a faculty member here at the university. I've been here for 27 years. I'm also a member of the organizing committee for the United Faculty. Uh, who are trying to bring collective bargaining to this university. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It, it was helpful for me to, to see how you're thinking about this. Um, the plan, uh, uh, President LaRiviere, that you lay out uh, purports to bring increased and stable funding to the, United St uh, to the University of Oregon, but it seems when it gets to the governance aspect of this to, uh, to maybe move towards less accountability to the people of the state. So I was wondering if you could talk specifically about two concerns that I have. How you can assure us in this community, uh, those of us who are, are students or those of us who are employees at the university or faculty members, first of all, how, how it can assure affordable tuition uh, for young people in the state of Oregon, and secondly, how it can improve the salaries of U of O employees and faculty uh, when people like me who've been around for 27 years uh, see us 
to continue to be at the bottom of the ranks of research universities uh, in the United States. How can you assure that for us, especially when so much of the governance is going to smaller bodies outside the purview of the uh, public debate and accountability? Is, is, is this working? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, with regard to governance, uh, in fact, there is going to be greater accountability, in my view, uh, to the publicly appointed board than there is at the current moment. Um, this board will be a public board, and it will be answerable to the governor and the legislature in just the, f the fashion that the current e state board is answerable to the governor and the legislature. Um, the difference will be, of course, that this board is responsible for a single university and will understand the challenges of a faculty that's at 80% of its peers' average salary, um, better than I suspect any other kind of governance could possibly do. Uh, so it's not as though we are going to change the accountability or the answerability to the existing uh, uh, political authorities, but rather enhance them. With regard to faculty salaries, um, our constraints with regard to faculty salaries since I have come here have been directly the relation uh, related to govern government policies, state government policies applying to entities other than the University of Oregon. So a freeze on all state agency salaries, in spite of the fact that we may have, bu have budgeted specifically to address, begin to address the remarkable um, lag in faculty salaries here. We have been prohibited from doing so. Under this governance structure, we would be not a state agency, but rather a public university as defined in the statute, answerable to the people of the state of Oregon, as defined in the statute. But we would have the authority to make the determination with regard to increases in salary on our own, rather than being uh, lumped in with other state agencies. And finally, with regard to tuition, at a public university, there are basically three sources of support for the cost of operating the place the state's investment, tuition, and private philanthropic gifts. Private philanthropic gifts are targeted at specific entities for the most part. Uh, it's, relative, it's not unheard of, but it's relatively rare that someone gives money just for the operation of the university. So the real sources of, of support with regard to ameliorating tuition are state and the state investment. If you look at the pattern here for the past 38 years, which is the period that we have good data for, the average annual increase in each of those 38 years has been 7.5% for tuition. Now, for those of you who, who like Professor Chalmers, work, work with, with money. That is an astonishing and really disheartening fact. And to add to that problem is that that 7.5% has not been a steady line. In fact, as those of you, Professor White, you have been here, you will know very well, what has happened over the course of those 38 years is that there has been a 2 or a 3% increase in a given year. And then there's a budget cut or some sort of crisis and there'll be a 15% increase that next year. Everybody probably felt terrible about that. So next year they try to quote unquote, keep tuition increases low. And there may be a three or 4% increase in that year. And then the year after that, there's another budget cut, a bill comes due, there's a crisis of one sort or another. We have had increases ranging from four, five, six percent, up to 25 percent and more in that 38-year period. With the result that there's no four-year period in that 38-year period where you don't have one of these spikes. 
So, and this won't be much of a stretch for many of us, imagine that you are that middle class family budgeting to the dollar the cost of your child's education at the University of Oregon. And most of our families are in that position. You managed to do it this year. But what about next year? Or God forbid what happened two years ago where we had to increase the bill in the middle of the year. This is an unfair burden on our students and on our fa families. And what I would dearly love to see is the stabilization of that funding source so that we get away from this pattern that we had in this last academic year of finding out in February how much money we're going to get from the state in an academic year that began in the previous June. We had to set our prices. We had to set our course offerings. We had to determine what, what our capacities were going to be in the housing arena in all of the ancillary services back in June, and we didn't find out what the state's share of that was going to be until February. One of the ways that you cope with that degree of uncertainty, particularly in an environment where it's regularly going to be cut, because that has been the pattern over the last 30 years, is you turn to the other source of your income to take away the uncertainty. The other source of income is tuition. What I would like to see happen is we stabilize what is now the state's appropriation. It ceases to be an appropriation and instead is a yield on the, on the endowment that Professor Chalmers talked about. We could then be in a situation where we are able to predict on a very reliable basis within a tolerable margin of error how much money we're likely to see from that endowment two, three, and perhaps even four years out. I would then like to get everybody around the table, the academic side, the housing side, the students themselves who assess pretty hefty taxes on themselves here, and say no more 7.5% increases for in-state tuition. No more 7.5% increases for the cost of attendance for in-state students. Let's manage in, the, in an environment where we can have a 4, 4.5, 5%, whatever the manageable number w might turn out to be as a result of those discussions and figure out exactly what it's going to cost, not just for the first year, but for the second year, the third year, and the fourth year. Under that kind of scenario, we could have a conversation with our incoming freshmen that said, this is what it will cost to attend the University of Oregon. That degree of certainty will be a huge relief to our middle class families. And in the bargain, I am absolutely convinced that we can stop that rate of increase and flatten it out. We're not going to cut it back. We're not going to stop tuition increases. For me to sit here and promise that would be the height of dishonesty or naivete at the very best. But we can slow it down. I'm quite certain of that but we can't slow it down under a scenario in which the state continues to say, here's how much money, oh, we're not going to give you that much money, we're, we'll get back to you about that amount of money. And that's been the pattern here for a very long time. That's a very long answer, but it's a very complicated and, and I think a very important aspect of this set of proposals. Thank you. Do the students want to get a question? Yes. Amelie Rousseau, who's the um, ASUO president. Hello. Again, my name is Amelie. I'm the student body president. Um, so the new partnership is an untested proposal um, costing upwards of a billion dollars. Um, so amidst one of our worst recessions in our state's history, um, this seems like a high risk for Oregon to take. And I'm wondering, um, has this proposal worked anywhere else in the country? Um, uh, I don't think there is a high risk. I think that's, uh, it, you're right, it is untested. Um, we are working under a very nicely tested system now, and we know its outcome, um, and that's what we're trying to fix. Um, this proposal has not, the, pr the funding proposal, the governance proposal is old news. Uh, we are actually an anomaly uh, governing our universities in the way that we do in the United States. Our governance proposal is quite common in 
it's, uh, it's the model in Michigan, North Carolina, Washington, Virginia, several other states. I, I can't remember them all now. Um, and, and works quite well there from a governance uh, perspective. Our funding proposal is unique. Uh, it has not been done before. Uh, it is subject to the very kinds of possibilities that Professor Chalmers articulated. <coughs> I think the likelihood that there would be a 0% return on the endowment that we're proposing over 30 years is very, very low. Um, possibly even a professor of finance might say that it's very near zero likelihood that there would be 0% return. And that is yet, that's the model that we are seeing under our current funding model. My position is we need to do something different. The current model, if we extrapolate for the next 10 years, will result in in-state tuition being somewhere around $17,000 a year. I find that an unacceptable prospect. We have to do something to avoid that. Thank you. Why don't we take a question from the um, middle um, microphone. Please state your name. Hi, I'm Scott Falstrom, uh, faculty member, non-tenure track. Uh, I'm interested a little bit, the, the UO Foundation is clearly highly interested in this plan and they've already invested quite a bit of money in getting the proposal put together. Um, I guess my question is twofold. Um, how much money are they willing to put forward to lobby for support currently? And should that get passed, they're also going to have to put forward some support to, to get that, uh, the bond measure being on the ballot. How much are they looking to put forward financially to get those two things passed? Um, well, th those are very good questions. I, um, I don't know that any conversation, ha there's been any conversation around specific dollar amounts for any of these efforts. Um, what I can tell you is that the, the foundation board, who are alums of this institution and care passionately about it, uh, I think, I, I, I shouldn't speak for, for anybody other than myself, but I think it's fair to say that they believe that this does present a, a sort of glimmer of hope for us in the face of the kinds of problems we've been facing and that they have demonstrated a remarkable commitment. They understand um, that they are willing, that, that there are going to be a further cost down the road to actually get this implemented, to lobby it through the legislative process, et cetera, and they have indicated their willingness to pay those costs. Thank you. Um, why don't we take question in the back microphone, please. The back microphone. My name is Star Holmberg. I'm a classified employee. There are about 1,400 of us on the campus. We take care of the grounds. We work in the kitchens. We work in offices. We have IT workers doing information technology, a great many different kinds of workers. We also have three representatives on the Senate. And my question is probably for the lawyer. The five at large positions, is it feasible that they could be classified employees? Uh, there could be anyone that the board uh, felt would uh, contribute to the university. Uh, they're at large, there are no, uh, there are no uh, specific requirements for those positions. We're getting some questions, um, written questions, so I'm going to start with one of them and I beg the indulgence of the people who are standing at the microphone. Um, first question is from a Portland um, employee who says, once we are no longer supported by the general fund, assuming that this plan is successfully enacted, is it possible that classified employees could opt out of the union? Or is the use of the general fund not the reason why we are required to be in the union? I'm not sure he feels comfortable answering that question. <coughs> I, I can answer that question. Uh, the difference between the general fund or the, uh, or the endowment fund has no bearing on whether you're in the union or not or whether you're the, whether the, uh, the, the class, uh, which classified bargaining unit uh, represents you. Thank you. Why don't we take uh, the next questioner from the front. 
here who's been waiting for a while. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> my name is Evan. I'm a student philanthropic chair for the Student Alumni Association. Um, I'm also actually a student supervisor at the annual giving program, and we um, fundraise for um, academics on a daily basis. Um, we're actually working right now. Um, and I'm kind of curious, because I keep hearing this um, word affordable tuition being thrown around, and I'm just wondering if anyone has kind of projected an amount for future students, or would it be something that we'll kind of deal with kind of based on what tuition is at that point? Um, I don't know if that's probably in the budget um, at this point yet, but. Um, well, first of all, Evan, um, I think it's fair to give you and your colleagues a bit of a shout out. Um, <laughs> Some of them are actually here right now. Um, if, uh, well, I, I was going to say you should all go and watch these folks uh, uh, call our alums, but probably not all of you at once. <laughs> yes, uh, please. This is a remarkable uh, enterprise, one of the most efficient and effective in the United States. It's a very little known fact, but uh, uh, these, these <laughs> folks raise a lot of money for the university from loyal alumni at a very, very, very high rate, uh, given the number of them and so on. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, there's a lot of, um, well, how, how candid should I be? <laughs> there's a lot of noise, I was going to use another word, but there's a lot of noise made about affordable tuition. Um, my, uh, my sense is that we lost the affordable tuition mm -hmm. argument about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And here's my reasoning. For, for many of us in this room who attended public universities, it was possible for us with a lot of good luck and some hard work to get a summer job that paid your tuition. You could earn enough in the summer to pay a year's tuition. In my case at the University of Iowa, it was about 1,200 bucks a year. And I could get a summer job where I could support myself and save enough to pay for that. That left room and board up to me. And I could live high on the hog or not so high on the hog, depending on what I could afford, what I wanted to spend. That was within my range of decision. Tuition this year at this university is more than $8,000 in state. There are no summer jobs that pay $8,000. So the notion that we're going to go back somehow to the model that was in effect when most of the public policy makers were attending public university is just <coughs> naive or maybe even dishonest. We're in a situation where that rate of increase, as we've talked about, was 241 percent or whatever it was since 1990, it's seven and a half percent a year. We've got to level that off and hope that the capacity of middle class families gradually catches up to those costs after we've leveled them off. I'm not wildly optimistic about that because I think we're going to have to have folks like you raising a lot of money to ensure access, but you can't raise money fast enough to catch up with that curve right now. And that's, that's, the, that's the nub of the matter. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a question from the middle microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Simran Gillespie, um, and I'm an uh, undergraduate here. I have, I have a couple questions, um, but I just have a few uh, clarifying ones before I get to those. Um, for Mr. Condit, you said that on the board would sit a student, a faculty representative, a representative of the State Board of Higher Education, five at-large members, and then what other kind? You said there was one more member? There's, uh, there's uh, seven members uh, appointed by the governor, including one student member and one faculty member. Uh, there is a member of the State Board of Higher Education appointed by the State Board of Higher Education. Uh, there is... There are, uh, there is uh, one member of the University of Oregon Foundation Board of Directors okay, appointed. Okay, that was, that was the one I missed, yeah. thank you. Um, okay, and also you said that there was uh, three public bodies to which the university would still be accountable, the uh, records, ethics, and what was the third one? 
uh, we'll pu all, of, all of the just uh, the public records law, the public meetings law, the ethics law, public employees collective bargaining act. There's actually quite a few uh, of the general public laws that would still be applicable to the university. It's mostly the business side, uh, where the current uh, where the, the, the currently has to be uh, several review steps up to BAS uh, to uh, for contracts and for sale of property or purchase purchase of property. That, that that would the university would get more flexibility on, and the board of directors would be advised on. Okay, thank you. Um, and now I have actual questions. Um, I'm I, I have a few concerns. One is that this uh, this committee is. It, you said that it was answerable to the state, um, but that seems somewhat abstract because it's not a state board. It's sitting, it will probably not meet in Salem. I would assume it would probably meet somewhere closer to the university. Um, and I have a fear that it's, it's not going to be very transparent, that it's gonna end up being kind of shady where the state will then have to go and pursue answers from this committee. Um, and I'm wondering how you anticipate seeing that as being more transparent um, and also, how would you prevent, um, uh, I, I guess, bias on behalf of the state trying to get around any regulations that it wants to get around as opposed to answering to an actual state committee? Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about this board actually standing up for the policies that the university should be following. Um, and my second question is, uh, that this model relies on tremendous amounts of fundraising. Um, is there any goal or any thought put into the ethics of that fundraising? Where is this money coming from? Um, because just getting money isn't ultimately important. The source of that money is as well. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure I, uh, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the first part of your, your question, Simran, um, um, how, does, how does one assure that any group of people behave in the way that they are supposed to? Um, I, I guess the same, question, the same set of questions could be put to the State Board of Higher Education that exists today. And there, um, if there were to be some kind of egregious failure of ethics laws or public meeting laws or whatever, they would be subject in the same way that this proposed board of directors is subject to the law. Um, a citizen, the governor, someone else could simply bring a complaint. Is that right, Jeff? Uh, that's right. I mean, it, it essentially, it's, it's appointed and would be uh, uh, governed by the same statutes and laws that are applicable to the State Board of Higher Ed right now. It would just be a local version, uh, and uh, but it would not, but that would not exempt it from having to comply with any of the kinds of uh, uh, rules that apply to public boards. And with regard to your second, the second portion of your question, Simran, uh, the source of funding. Uh, this is a dilemma that confronts every uh, every entity that relies on the largesse of of the public. Um, from time to time, uh, a deal is presented to every university, every uh, philanthropic enterprise that is not in the best interest of that enterprise, and you turn it down. Um, and that, that happens with, with surprising regularity at a place like this. Um, it's... Uh, it's an unfortunate, well, maybe I shouldn't re reveal my bias. It is the case that today, uh, Oregon and all of America has decided that the investment that we have historically made in public education, not just public higher education, but public education, is not an investment that they want to continue to make at the same rate. What are we going to do about that? Well, for public higher education at the University of Oregon, that's where this proposal is coming from. It's a response to that reality. So let me um, take this opportunity to ask a question that was written in by the audience. 
member of the audience. If the university was no longer a state agency, would employees still be state employees with full state benefits? Maybe Jeff can answer that. Sure. Um, they would continue to be public employees and would still be subject to, the university would still be required to comply with the public employees collective bargaining act. The act provides that the university could uh, assume collective bargaining uh, uh, with its employee groups uh, from the state system, but also provides a transition provision that says that they, there will be no local state bargaining unless the, uh, uh, the labor unions come to the table and bargain it. So you can continue under the state contract and unless and until both sides, union and management, decide that local contract uh, would be more beneficial. I have a related question here from another audience member. How does the plan affect the status of faculty and staff? Specifically, how would PERS and PEB benefits be affected for these groups? Uh, the answer is the same. Uh, the university is given the option to offer alternative uh, retirement programs and offer alternative benefit programs, uh, but they would uh, but you would still continue to stay into PEB and in PERS unless and until that change. And actually, you would cons always continue to be have the option of staying in PERS. So it only off uh, authorizes an, an additional program. It wouldn't be a replacement. Thank you. Let's take a question from the uh, middle microphone, please. Thank you, Nathan. Is it on? <coughs> Hello? OK. Uh, so I'm Nathan Howard. I work uh, with the student government uh, as the environmental advocate. Um, and I have a little bit of a preface to my question. The question is in the last sentence. Um, so a lot of students and a lot of Eugene community members are concerned with your, and when I say um, your, I mean President Revere and the university administration, accountability to students, faculty, and to the greater community of Eugene. Um, <coughs> and just to pause for a second, thank you for holding this town hall um, and giving us the opportunity to ask questions. I forgot to say that. Um, so the University of the university administration has repeatedly chosen to act contrary to the interests of students and faculty. Um, and for example, um, even though the ASUS Senate and the university Senate um, passed unanimous resolutions uh, strongly opposing the building of an office complex and parking lots on a riverfront um, open space, the administration remains intent on doing this. Um, currently, the student and faculty members of the State Board of Higher Education represent our interests, and thus, under the current system, we have an opportunity to hold the university administration accountable. Under the new partnership proposal, student and faculty representation on the local governing board um, will be limited to two members, and they may not have a chance to vote. Um, I'm not sure if they would be able to, but people have been saying, or expressed concern that they may not have an, an ability to vote. Um, could you please explain what meaningful resource students and faculty will have under the new partnership if the administration continues to make decisions that disregard the voices of the university um, community and the Eugene community? Thank you. Um, Jeff, do you want to address the voting issue? Right. Uh, no, the student and faculty members uh, would both be voting members of the board, so they would both have the authority to participate in the discussions and to vote. Uh, and that's similar to the State Board of Higher Education, where there's one faculty member uh, and one student member on the state board. So that kind of representation wouldn't change, um, but uh, uh, it's a um, the student member and the faculty member are on the same state board. That's under correct. This, it would be that you are a faculty member and you are a student on that board. And you know, perhaps I'm a little prejudiced. Uh, my background is actually in local government. I, I joined the firm in 1998, and prior to that, I was in house city attorney for Lake Oswego. And prior to that, Benton County Council in Corvallis. Uh, <laughs> and my experience with local government is that it's always more responsive because it's there. Uh, the board will meet on a campus. The students can directly attend the meetings. Or have to be public meetings. All the records of the board will be public records. Um, my my view is is that the uh, government closest to the uh, to the uh, governed is the government the government that's most responsive, and uh, I've seen that in local government all the time. So I really think that you know you're going to have a stronger voice on the governing board, students and faculty members, than you do on the state board, and it will be a board that's focused on the university and meeting here in Eugene. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is William Price. I'm a senior here at the University of Oregon. 
Um, in order for this plan to come to fruition, multiple bills must make it through the legislature, at least one constitutional amendment must be adopted, and the public must approve an $800 million bond measure. What is the political viability of this plan? Thank you. Um, uh, slam dunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, there have to be, uh, the, the legislation has to be approved. The statute, statutory change of Senate Bill 559 needs to be approved. And Senate Joint Resolution 20 needs to be, uh, well, it can be referred by the legislature to the public. Now, my uh, political career in Oregon is exactly 19 months old. My political experience in Oregon is 19 months old. Um, so I'm just going on the basis of what uh, uh, more experienced people than I have told me. And, and I am told that there has never been an instance in which one of these amendments with regard to public bonds uh, that, that uh, Jeff Condit referred to earlier has been turned down when referred by the, by the legislatures of the people. I, I don't know that that's the case. I've been told that. I would hope that would be the case in this, in this instance. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that making these kinds of fundamental changes in, in the way an institution of this uh, richness in a state is governed and financed is, it's new. I think it was Amelie who uh, referred to the fact that this hasn't been done before. And there are a lot of people in the world who say, well, if it's not been done before, it shouldn't be done now. That's a sort of instinctive human reaction. We're running into some of that, to be perfectly candid. Um, there's going to be a lot of heavy lifting necessary to get this through the legislative session. Uh, I'm not naive that we are going to just waltz in and on the basis of our compelling and wonderful argument, everybody's going to stand up and say aye. Um, but not doing this, not trying to do this at least, will result with a great deal of certainty in a doubling of our tuition in the next 10 years. And that's not acceptable in my view. And I would feel um, personally culpable knowing that and saying, well, I hope somebody fixes it. It's our job to fix it. If we don't come up with the ideas, with the interests that we have collectively in the viability of this institution, who's going to do it? Thank you. Um, I have a couple of written questions. I think we'll go to those first, okay? Then we'll get back to you. Um, the first question is, who decides how the endowment money is invested? Maybe John, can, do you feel comfortable with uh, I think, One of you. I think that's an open question to, to, to some degree, but uh, certainly I think we would want a portion uh, to be invested by the UO Foundation. Uh, they have an incredible track record. Um, they have uh, a lot of experience in investing in an endowment fund, and they have the best interests of the university uh, directly in their sights. So, um, and I think, I think one thing, and with all due respect to the president uh, when he says this hasn't been done before. Um, something just like this hasn't been done before, but there are an awful lot of institutions in this country that operate very well with endowments. And that is how they get a large portion of their money. That's how they provide financial aid. That's how they provide uh, salaries and research uh, monies to the faculty. So I think, I think endowment models are not a new invention. Uh, the source of the funding for this endowment model is a new idea. Thank you. I have one more question. I'm going to go for writing, then we'll go to you guys. Has the possibility of having the UO going online full force been factored into financial estimates? This could be done in conjunction with other universities in Oregon and Washington. If not, should there be a UO commission to evaluate this? Going online could produce big financial advantages. I'm sorry, Nathan, what going online? Um, well, it just says going online full force. I think just having oh, a, an online curriculum rather than what we have now. Well, um, 
certainly online or, or at least uh, <coughs> media assisted instruction is part of our future. Uh, uh, those, uh, those, uh, those who have been involved in the development of online course offerings know that there isn't a great deal of savings attendant uh, to that in terms of actual dollar outline. Now there may be the ability to reach audiences you couldn't reach otherwise, there may be advantages to asynchronous instruction, et cetera, et cetera. But the notion that you simply put something online and it replaces um, Finance 101 uh, is, is, hasn't been borne out in anyone's experience yet. It's almost certainly the case that as we, as, as technology continues to evolve, more and more of it will be part of our, our lives. It's already changed the way we teach because any question at all just about can be answered, any question of fact can be answered almost immediately by Googling the question in class instead of saying, uh, let's think about that, I'll get back to you next week. You can get the answer immediately. And that's, that's a wonderful innovation, but it's not cheap. Correct. Thank you. <coughs> we'll go to the first questioner in the front microphone, please. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bowman. I'm the Legislative Affairs Coordinator for the Student Government here. Um, again, thank you guys for allowing us to, uh, to ask questions. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so both Governor Kitzhaber and many members of the Oregon Legislature have reaffirmed that they will continue in the tradition of prioritizing education policy with a statewide perspective. How will your plan affect the state of Oregon uh, as a whole, and how will this proposal affect other Oregon universities, specifically universities like Southern Oregon University, Eastern Oregon University, and Western Oregon University? Thank you. Well, first of all, our responsibility for educating the the sons and daughters of the state of Oregon is shared amongst all of these institutions. And to the extent that any of us is viable, it's good for that mission, and to the extent that we're not viable, it's harmful to that mission. Our notion is that once this funding model is, is put in place, um, that First of all, any university can avail itself of this model. Um, and, and that's the, we, we asked Jeff to draft that legis the legislation, the proposal in exactly that way. But once that's the case for us, let's assume for the sake of argument, this big assumption that we've raised the money to match and the state has matched and we've now got the endowment. We are no longer at the appropriation table. We have stepped away from the demands on the, on the state budget to operate this place completely. And we will be away from them for 30 years during that period of time when they are paying off this, this bond. And at the end of those 30 years, they will not only not be paying the bond, but we still won't be at the appropriation table. So we will supplant this, the money that the state would have given us in the appropriation process with the proceeds of the endowment as described by uh, Professor Chalmers. There are proposals, uh, I just learned of one today, a remarkably inventive, creative proposal that is going to be put forth in this session related to the tax structure and so on. I don't want to go into details because I'm A, not authorized and B, not qualified. When that money, let's assume that that money becomes available and the Oregon economy is going to recover over those next 30 years. There will be good days. When there's additional investment in higher education, the University of Oregon will not be at the table. And our contribution, if you look at it in this way, is that the share that would have come to us will be going to those other institutions. Does that, does that make, make sense? Well, I, 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 I doubt it because if you, if you take the state board's position at their word that everyone should be treated equally, if it's necessary to cut the budget, we won't be in that mix either. Uh, I mean, we are, we, are, we are fixed under this structure. We are fixed for 30 years. And the institution, the University of Oregon, bears all the cost of inflation. 
So there will be inflation so that the 60 some odd million that were in our model will diminish in terms of purchasing power dramatically over those 30 years by a factor of 40 or 50 percent if the previous performance holds. And we'll have to make that up with additional, with, with our endowment structure. And that's how, how endowments are designed is to, keep, to outpace inflation to make, preserve the purchasing power of the original gifts. All of that will be to the advantage of the other institutions because we're out of the equation now. Thank you. Let's take a question from the middle microphone, please. Uh, I don't have a question, but I have a statement. Um, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Lois Yoshishige, and I'm on the executive committee of Local 085, the University of Oregon local for SEIU 503. Our local and our union doesn't have an official position on, uh, on this yet. We have guiding principles that we are using to evaluate all the restructure proposals, and we are not ready to sign on to any proposal at this time. We want any changes to involve and strengthen the entire OUS system not just one school, so all parts of the state are served well. We have statewide issues that SEIU is pursuing and have concerns about how the whole system works together. One of our concerns about several of these bills is the role of the oversight board, which would replace the state legislature's oversight of the university or universities. It is not clearly defined as to what these boards are going to do concerning important areas such as tuition, accessibility for all, and bargaining fair wages, and et cetera. We're not sure what these board's powers will be, what they will do, and what their accountability will be to the public. And so we can't support something that we don't know fully yet how it's gonna work. We look forward to the upcoming debate in the legislature and want to be part of a solution that will strengthen all of our OUS institutions. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a comment? Anybody want to make a comment? Uh, I, I would just stay, uh, state that uh, this does this bill would not take away the legislature's oversight authority. Uh, this is a statutory amendment. Uh, the legislature always has the authority to come in and amend it uh, every biennium. So uh, we still are subject to their goodwill, and the university would have a extreme incentive to be both uh, accountable and uh, transparent uh, in order to preserve the independence that the legislature grants us. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. Like, uh, the legislature still has ultimate control because they can change the structure every two years. Thanks, Jeff. Our next questioner up here in the front. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I'm Daniel Pope in the History Department. And first, I want to thank you all for your uh, openness and your uh, informative presentations. I have a couple of questions about the endowment, one on the private side and one on the uh, bonded side. On the bonded side, can we be certain, can we be reasonably well assured that uh, a bond issue of this magnitude in which the, uh, the proceeds are going to be dedicated to the University of Oregon um, will be uh, tax exempt when they're sold? I know there have been many issues regarding tax exempt status. And on the private side, um, as was mentioned earlier in the afternoon, uh, contributions to um, endowments for universities are customarily dedicated rather than unrestricted. If half of the uh, capital from which we draw our income is labeled for particular purposes, have we not ceded a good deal of our internal budgetary authority to the sources of that 800 billion, 800 billion, what did it were, 800 billion, um, that uh, decide that this is to go to Project X or Department Y? Jeff, I can answer the, the first question, uh, which 
is that the, these bonds, as they're structured, would not be tax-exempt bonds. They'd be taxable bonds for uh, the IRS. Uh, if you're taking money and issuing bonds and investing it, which is what this um, assumes, they need to be taxable. And with regard to uh, the, the second part of your question, a very good uh, question. Um, uh, we are we are assuming that the matching portion of uh, the, the private match to the public public bonds will be used to support the operation of the university. And the definition of the operation of the university is all the bills we have to pay here. So if someone comes and endows, uh, makes a gift to endow a room in a dormitory, that endowment allays the, a portion of the cost of that dormitory. If someone makes an in, a gift that is an endowment for a professorship or a chair, that the proceeds for, from that allay, allay that portion of the cost of the operation of the university. And so we look upon the donations that can be used for the operation of the university as matching this money. Does that, does that make sense? We're, we're looking at the whole cost of the operation of this place. And, and the way the constitutional amendment is written is the matching funds have to be dedicated to this uh, endowment fund, which is for the operation of the university. So I think of the way the constitutional amendment uh, was drafted, we couldn't use specified funds as a match for the endowment. And that's part of the attraction of the endowment because it provides an incentive to get an unrestricted gift as opposed to the restricted gift, which as you mentioned are, are typically uh, uh, the kinds of gifts that universities give. All right, thank, thank you for your answer. Thank you. We'll take the next questioner at the front microphone, please. Hello, uh, my name is Thomas Walker. I'm a student here. And um, I had, one concern that I'd like to raise and then a question, one is um, Simran addressed it earlier about um, the ethics of investing. And I don't feel like that was addressed, at least in the way I, I would like it to be. Um, I don't even know if you can fully address it because it's a big question. Um, and it regards ethics in terms of investing in companies um, that treat their workers fairly or that are not environmentally environmentally destructive because um, those are big questions and the university uses words like green and sustainable and uh, I'd like that you know to be fulfilled in some way um, my other question is uh, hasn't really been addressed tonight and I read the at least some of the new partnership a while ago I don't know if any of it's changed um, but it's regarding what uh, I understood is a a police force on the University of Oregon campus was, I believe, that's a small not, part. That's not part of the, th that's a separate issue altogether. Well, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, with regard to the ethics of investing, um, this is an issue that is with us regardless of this proposal. Uh, we have already an endowment of not a big enough endowment in my view, but uh, we have an endowment of some 400 and some odd million dollars, I think, it, last time I, s I saw the number. And these issues are there now. Um, and the way that, um, the way the money that we're, pr we're talking about, the new money injected into this process would be managed, would in large measure be determined by the state treasurer, I suspect, uh, more than suspect, and in conversations with him, uh, around this, and keep in mind we have no firm proposals, it's just pr conversation at this point. Um, we are talking about, in the model that Professor Chalmers talked about, $800 million of state money. You can't just turn that over to a private agency and say, here's the money, it's yours now, go do with you what you want with it. You still have to have the state treasurer overseeing that investment. And exactly how the state treasurer chooses to do that is going to be up to the legislature and the state treasurer. I'm personally not terribly concerned about that because Oregon's ability to manage its investments has been remarkably good for
for a very long time. I haven't been so good in terms of making commitments about the yield on those investments. We've probably overcommitted, uh, which has given rise to some problems in PERS and PEB, but, but the actual management of the corpus of those endowments, and Professor Tillman knows more about this, is, has actually been pretty good in the state. It's been very good. All right, why don't we take a question here, then I'll read a question that I have here. Go ahead. My name is Carissa Sarais, and I am a senior here at the U of O and also the president of the Student Alumni Association. And I'm also a native Eugenian, and the idea of in-state tuition doubling within the next 10 years just sickens me. Um, the fact that um, local Oregonians might not be able to come here because of tuition being so outrageous is just really sad because I love the school and I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. So I just applaud you guys for even considering that and trying to make some sort of change because that just is unfathomable to, unfathomable to me that it's so high. Um, so I guess my question is, what can students do to kind of get more involved with this or to help um, go forward with this or to ask where to go to ask any questions? I know this is a great place, but um, any other resources that students can have or places to go to um, help out or to get more involved or to ask more questions? Um, well, uh, thank you, uh, Kirsa, for that question. Um, <coughs> I hate to be like all the rest of us and assume that since we've got a web page, that solves all your problems. Uh, but we do have a pretty robust set of data on the web page. So if you go to the university's front main page, this little box over the side that says new partnership, you can click on there. What's there? What's there is, first of all, the 115 page uh, piece of legislation, feel free to read it. Uh, uh, um, but also uh, some pretty high level analysis at the level that th these graphs, for example, that Professor Chalmers showed are explained there. Uh, not as lucidly as he explained them, of course, but they are explained there. Um, you should feel free to encourage students to learn about this proposal. And um, the Alumni Association itself has pretty enthusiastically embraced this idea. Uh, they are generating their own materials for their own membership. Um, our challenge is that this is, this is not uh, um, entertainment tonight. This involves finance, it involves public policy, it involves treasured institutions that, that we think we know about but we may or may not. And it's very hard to educate people. And I am absolutely open and f in, in, in fact welcome suggestions about how we can, or should we have more of these kinds of meetings? Should we have meetings like this targeted at specific subgroups of the community? Uh, what kinds of information do you feel is still very foggy and you don't get, give us that feedback. Send it to me personally, send it to the President of the Senate, maybe not, well, send it to Professor Chalmers too. He'll, he'll forward <laughs> it to, to Nathan or to me. Because this isn't, um, the more everybody knows about this, the better. And the, the only really uh, comforting thing that I have felt in, in all of this process so far is that I feel like f for the first time, at least in my career, that we've got a public engagement around what are, in my view, the most some of the most important issues confronting us, and that's good. Uh, so any suggestions you have about what more you want to know, uh, what isn't clear, let us know, and we'll do our best to, to get the information to you. Can I just jump in with one one thought also is that, uh, I mean, the president has been, I've, I've heard him speak a few times about this particular part, new partnership plan, and one of the most refreshing things that, that I've heard many, many times is we have a big problem. We have this problem that state tuition is, is out of control. We need, to, we need to get it under control. Here's a plan. If you've got a better one, let's talk about it. Um, that we aren't uh, wed to this one if someone's got a better idea, but we know that the status quo is a bad idea. So let's take a question from the back, the last microphone, please. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Um, first, I would just like you have to, to tell uh, us who you are, please. Oh, my name is Robert DeAndrea, and I uh, just wanted to make a comment in response to something that I believe President Lerviere said earlier, and if I misunderstood at all, then please correct me. Um, but I just wanted to say that I'm proud to attend a university where students robustly prepare themselves to be citizens, and I strongly believe the student fee, our student fee, is neither a tax nor too high. Um, but onto my question, I'm a non-traditional student, and I know that the greatest intangible factor in attending a state university is the diversity of the student body and how accessible it remains to the students of the state. Um, the, uh, our incoming freshman class, I believe, has the largest number of out-of-state students ever. Is it a part of the plan to eventually cap the number of out-of-state students? Can you give any indication of um, whether that's possible and what you'd like that number to be? Um, well, first of all, I didn't say that you, your tax was too high. I just said it was quite substantial. Uh, and the fact that the students collect and distribute some 12 or 15 or 14 million, however it, much it is, is that's a substantial number. So that's all I, I was saying. Um, uh, with regard to, oh yes, out-of-state students. Um, uh, the university is currently, as I understand it, 38% out-of-state. Uh, the freshman class this year was 49.1% out-of-state. We turned down no qualified Oregonian this uh, regime and in fact have had the highest percentage, I believe, of uh, students of color in this freshman class as well, 28%. <coughs> um, so from a diversity standpoint, we're making some progress, uh, not adequate progress in my view, but um, uh, progress nonetheless and our hope is that we make more progress and more rapid progress. Um, with regard to capping uh, out-of-state participation, uh, a lot of states have done this in the past. They're all walking away from it, in some cases running away from it, because the fact of the matter is, is that out-of-state students subsidi subsidize in-state students uh, very heavily. So we haven't really sat down and said, here's the percentage that we must have or the percentage that we should have or any other sort of thing. Uh, our sense is that given the demography of the state of Oregon, that we've got a lot of work to do to get st the students in Oregon ready to participate in higher education. And our goal is to stay as accessible to those students as possible. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time today talking about accessibility being equated to the cost of attendance, and there's certainly a correlation. But there's also a correlation in terms of preparation for success at a place like this. And if the price is virtually free, but the students are unable to succeed here because of the poor quality of their preparation in the K-12 environment, we've still lost the battle. So we've got to sh shoulder uh, a fair bit of the responsibility to ensure that K-12 is adequately funded in the state as well, and that's our intention to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a question in the middle, please. Yeah, I'm Deborah Mylander, and I'm an officer of administration on campus. And um, I was a little curious, or trying to understand the response to Professor Pope's question, because on the one hand, I heard legal counsel say that the private gifts would be um, Unrestricted, but then um, Professor Rivera, or excuse me, <laughs> President Rivera said that they might have some restrictions, and that led me to my second question of: There's been a lot of discussion about getting money in, and I'm wondering, wondering what kind of framework there is for allocation in the budgeting process. Um, Thank you. Well, we have, as as you may know, Deborah, we've just moved to a new budget model here um, that was. Uh, implemented this year, I think, for the first time, that, that I was going to say rationalizes, it was not an irrational process, but changes the allocation of internal resources. Um, and I think makes, makes uh, more comprehensible the budget decisions that the university's uh, making on an annual basis. That won't change. We're not going to change, we have no, no, 
no plans to change the the new budget model. It will stay as it as it uh, as it has been. That's the result of this impl implementation this year. Um, I also heard something different from uh, uh, from Jeff than uh, than I thought I was going to hear. When we have, we will determine what the match is, and our intention is to follow the. <coughs> it's called CASE. Um, it's an acronym that all universe uh, for fundraising enterprises for universities. The committee on. Is is anybody here who can tell me what CASE stands? Council for the Advancement of. Education. Where does the S come from? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh adv advancement. Well, anyway, CASE is the acronym. All of the fundraisers for universities and actually for K-12 schools, et cetera, uh, are not all, but most are members of this. They establish the criteria for the, uh, for the accounting for gifts in campaigns. So we just finished an $850 million campaign here a couple of years ago. How do you count that money? If the money has been promised but hasn't shown up, do you count it? If it's an estate gift and the person's 25 years old and won't die for another 70 years, can you count that money or not? Case answers that question. It's our intention to calculate this based on case standards or how you count a match with this difference, and this may be what, what Jeff was, was alluding to, is that we have to have the money cross our books before it can count as a match for the purpose of this endowment. So we have to have the money in hand before it will match the endowment, the, 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 the state's portion of the bond. And that means that, and this is important also for the debt capacity issue, we are not going to be able to raise this money in a year. Probably not two years, probably not three years, probably maybe not even four years. It's going to be incremental. So we'll be going back to the state for tranches of money. What, that is, let's say we've raised 100 million under this system. We've got that 100 million in hand, and it's now time to go to the state for their matching portion. And that, that will be very deliberate and very, um, carefully accounted for. We've talked with the treasurer about this, this process. It will have to cross our books before we can count it as a match. Does that, does that help? Is that, okay. All right, I have one um, other question here. How have our peer institutions benefited from adopting similar models? Will U of O benefit in the same way, i.e. benefits to students, faculty, salary, facilities, et cetera? <coughs> Um, well, the governance model, as I said, is a pretty common uh, phenomenon, and um, I mean, you just look at how Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia, Washington, et cetera, are, are govern themselves. That's essentially what we're proposing. Um, the benefits are are tangible in the sense that. I mean, this is an $800 million a year enterprise. Let's think about it from that perspective. And we don't have a board of directors. Now, there isn't another $800 million a year enterprise anywhere, public, private, anywhere, that doesn't have a board of directors. And the purpose of a board of directors is to represent the interest of stakeholders in a private corporation, they're the investors in the corporation. In a public university, they are the public that that university is to serve. And it's the job of those people to be in the business of the enterprise, to say, no, don't do it that way. Uh, no, you can't ignore <coughs> this issue. Uh, you have to focus on this. This is a much more important question than that question. And right now, we don't have that. And this is part of the increased accountability issue, is that the public is going to be in the business of this <coughs> university in a way that it has never been before. 
And I'll be very candid with you, I've got colleagues elsewhere who think I'm nuts. Who in the world would want 15 people sitting on your campus, looking over your shoulder <coughs> with a great deal of information about your daily operation when you've got a situation where that doesn't exist? And my response to that is that I fully expect, if I'm the president here when this actually gets implemented, that I'm going to have disagreements with that board. I'm going to have uh, uh, differences of opinion about what priorities they think should be implemented versus what I think should be implemented. But I would, as a <coughs> beneficiary of public higher education, I'd much rather have that group involved in our business than simply leaving it to the best faith that administrators can bring to bear in executing their responsibilities. It's a better way to govern an institution like this. And I think um, if you talk to people who've had a lot of experience, Mark Emmert just stepped down as the president of the University of Washington. He was president of Connecticut, president of Louisiana State University, I think one other university. It's his judgment that the structure at Washington was the best that he had seen in terms of actually being able to meet the needs of the public. And that's what we're aspiring to here. Will it be perfect? I can promise you it will not be. Will it solve all of our problems? I can promise you it will not. Will it give rise to new problems that we don't have now? Almost certainly. But will it be a better way to run this university over the long term for the interest of all the people who have a stake in it? I think so. I'd like to end today's session by just reiterating what we discussed at the beginning. That is, that in my personal experience, this is probably the most important proposal that has come forward at this university. And as such, I think it affects every one of us here. And I think it's important that we all understand it, think about it, talk it up, talk about the good points, talk about the bad points, and try and work together to try and sculpt a proposal that will make this university the best place it can be. In that regard, I'd like to thank the president, Professor Chalmers, Jeff Condit, for being here and answering your questions quite forthrightly, I believe. I'd also like to thank all of you for coming and asking your questions. I'd like to thank all the people who are watching this online and on video. I want to thank also, finally, but not last, the people who helped put this together, the people in the president's office, Karen and Tim Black. I'd like to thank the ASL signers who have done a terrific job. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and we'll call it a night. Thank you. And, yeah. One, one more uh, group that deserves our gratitude, and that is uh, the President of the Senate and the Senate for having this idea and for being the impetus and organizers behind it. Thank you. Thank you.